This video is brought to you by John Robson Guitar Tuition. If you enjoy the content, please consider supporting the channel by enrolling on a course, purchasing some guitar lessons or a t-shirt, or you can join my Patreon. Now, on with the show. Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. Now, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, you may recall that last week I did a video called My Five Bucket List Guitars. I wasn't talking about, you know, oh, one day I'd love to own a 1957 Strat or a 1959 Les Paul or something like that. I was being much, much more specific. I was talking about individual specific instruments that were used on iconic recordings. And it's not a case of I want to own those guitars. It's just a case I would love to pick it up and play it and just feel the history of the instrument. And there were quite a few comments underneath that video that were saying, um, I'm surprised you didn't include this one, or why didn't you mention that one, or various variations on, on that theme. And to be honest, I knew as I was putting that video together that there was probably going to be a part two, and that's what we're doing today. So here are five more of my bucket list guitars, beginning with... Francis Rossi's Green Telecaster. Yes, indeed. The um, iconic, I think, uh, Francis Rossi Telecaster. I've always been a huge fan of status quo, and I don't care that it's not cool. Look at me. When was the last time you think I was worried about how cool I am? Um, you know, it's just a, a part of my growing up, part of my musical education, you know, um, just seeing status quo that I think the first time I saw them live was uh, when there was the televised live at the NEC performance uh, with Prince Charles in attendance. Yeah, something tells me that was uh, not his, uh, not his first choice of night out. But anyway, um, this guitar recently sold at Bonham's auction house for about 120,000 quid and, um, you know, which is a marked, uh, profit on the 75 pounds that, uh, Francis paid for it in 1968. It's a 1957 Telecaster, basically. And as you can see, it's been heavily modified over the years. Let's take a look at another picture of it. There it is in close up. You can see that it's, uh, got a, Tunematic uh, bridge and tailpiece, uh, hot rails pickups in the neck and bridge position, and I believe that's uh, a lace sensor pickup in the middle position there. What I would really like to do, though, is go back in a time machine and play this version of the guitar. You can see, uh, although it's a bit of a grainy photograph, that's obviously from uh, Core's set at Live Aid, and it's I believe it's still got the original lipstick pickup in the neck position there. Can't see what's going on in the bridge, but the uh, the uh, middle pickup is absent, and it's got a different style of tailpiece on it as well. For me, that is the iconic image of that Telecaster kicking off the uh, Live Aid Global Jukebox. It's the guitar that played the solo on Rockin' All Over the World. It's the guitar that played on Just Supposing. It's the guitar that um, played on Caroline and Down the Dust Pipe and all of those iconic uh, core hits. And as I say, that was a big part of uh, my musical upbringing. So that's why that one's on the list. Next... The Black Stratocaster. Yes, indeed. Um, another heavily modified guitar, David Gilmore's Black Strat. Um, I didn't really know that David Gilmore played this Black Strat, to be honest with you, because when I first started seeing um, footage of Pink Floyd live, or I think I'd seen the live at Pompeii gig, um, you know, at some point, uh, you know, as a teenager, but it was uh, in the late 80s when the, the post-Roger Waters uh, uh, Pink Floyd kind of emerged that I started to see, there was a lot of Pink Floyd on the TV, basically. They did that gig in Venice, and there was qu quite a few other things. And uh, David Gilmore was playing a Candy Apple Red Strat with uh, EMG pickups in it, and I just thought, well, that's the guitar he plays, you know. Uh, it wasn't until later on that I discovered that there was this guitar, which is, um, you know, a bit of a mongrel, it has to be said. Um, that this is the guitar that played on the, you know, Dark Side of the Moon and The Wall and, you know, all the great Pink Floyd classic albums. 
Um, it's a 1969 uh, Stratocaster, I believe, and um, you know, obviously the neck has been changed because that's not a 1969 headstock. It's had various modifications over the years. It's had um, a Carla tremolo installed, and the body routed out for it, and then uninstalled, and the body filled in, and it's had uh, a PAF pickup uh, in between the two single coils that was put in, and then taken out. Various bits and pieces and bells and whistles have gone on with this guitar over the years but it is now uh, pretty much well a stock Stratocaster if you want to think of it that way um, in terms of its adornments obviously the neck isn't uh, I think the neck is off a 1983 uh, vintage reissue Stratocaster that got added on at some point it's got that uh, famous Gilmore mod on it, which um, which is where you can have the neck and bridge pickups on at the same time. And um, you know, accounts vary about how much uh, Mr. Gilmore uses that, but it's it's on there. And yeah, it's the guitar that uh, was used on the solo from Comfortably Numb. That alone makes it deserve a place on this list. Uh, but you know, think of all of those classic Pink Floyd uh, guitar parts. You know, uh, all of Dark Side of the Moon, the solo from you know uh, Time, for example, is another high point for me. And um, yeah, massive Pink Floyd fan. This is the guitar that's uh, very much the engine room of the guitar sound on all those classic Floyd tracks. So that's why this one is on the list. Next, Gary Moore's Red Stratocaster. Indeed, another Stratocaster. Um, this is uh, Gary Moore's infamous or famous, whichever you want to say, uh, red 1961 Strat. It's not been modified as much as um, Francis Rossi's Telecaster or um, you know David Gilmore's Strat, but it has had uh, a few changes rung over the years. Uh, I believe that's mainly uh, with the pickups. Um, yeah, the first time I saw Gary playing this guitar was in um, a BBC show, actually, BBC TV programme called Rock School that was on in the uh, early 80s, where a very young and fresh-faced Gary is, uh, I think this was on the Corridors of Power to an album sort of era, so that kind of dates it. Uh, Gary is kind of describing how he has his uses different effects to shape his tone while he's uh, describing his rig on this BBC show, and um, yeah, that made a big impression on me back then. And uh, just then, I eventually heard the Corridors of Power album and. Check out the uh, the version of Wishing Well on that album. What an immense guitar tone. And uh, apparently that was this Red Stratocaster. I'll try and link to all of these uh, examples of all of these guitars in the description below. And um, I'll see if I can find that Rock School clip that I was talking about. But I will definitely link to probably one of the most famous clips of this guitar being used which is um from the fender 50th anniversary of the fender stratocaster 50th anniversary concert that was held held at wembley where G where uh, gary does a fantastic barnstorming performance of Jimi hendrix's red house on this guitar what an amazing instrument what an amazing player what an amazing guitar that's why it's on the list next the red special yeah, what can we say about this guitar? Um, you all know the story of this guitar. It's iconic. There is, this is, if ever there was a guitar that was a true one-off and completely irreplaceable, it's this one. Uh, the story, in case you don't know, a brief summary is that uh, Brian wanted an electric guitar when he was an adolescent, and um, you know because they couldn't afford his family couldn't afford a Fender or a Gibson or something like that, they set about building a guitar. It's well documented that it's the main kind of section of the uh, the neck and the body is um, essentially an old oak fireplace that they trimmed down to uh, to build it. Uh, there's a clip of uh, Brian um, talking about this guitar where he actually um, shows you where they filled the, uh, the the wormholes, the wood wormholes, with uh, bits of toothpick or matchstick or something. Um, the, the tremolo system is made out of an old knitting needle and the the spring off a bicycle seat. The uh, you know the the fret markers are actually um, you know buttons from his mother's haberdashery box. You know it goes on and on. It's just an inspired instrument, and it's such an iconic instrument. And yes, there are you know Brian May guitars that you can go out and buy. You know you can buy a, a Brian May signature guitar, but it's not the same guitar. It's um, you know it's not even the uh, the luthier built uh, backup guitars that Brian uses uh, on tour 
aren't the same as this no to no guitar will be built this way really it's a bolt on neck but it's it's not got like a traditional four bolts it's one just one big nut and bolt holding the neck neck and body together it's a completely unique guitar it's the guitar that you hear on as i'm sure you know bohemian rhapsody we are the champions another one bites the dust um not crazy little thing called love. He played a Telecaster on that though. But you know all of the fantastic, um, iconic Queen tunes that we all grew up listening to, and that are just part and part parcel of our culture. Now it's all down to this guitar, which, if you're talking about guitars that des- that are iconic and deserve a place on any bucket list, you got to include this one. So that's why it's here. Next, Jeff Beck's Telly Gibb. Yes, indeed, the Telly Gibb, uh, Jeff Beck's uh, famous uh, twin humbucker Telecaster. I first saw a picture of this guitar in um, that excellent uh, publication, Ralph Denyer's Guitarist's Handbook, the Guitar Handbook, I beg your pardon, uh, back in the early 80s when I was about 15 or 16, I think. And I'd never seen such a thing in my life. It's like, hang on, that's a Telecaster. I recognise that. I know these things. Um, but why has it got Gibson pickups and a Gibson bridge and a Gibson tailpiece? It was, to, to my young, inexperienced uh, eyes back then, that was a little bit like hearing a, a dog go meow or a cat go woof. You know, it just didn't compute. But dear me, it looked so cool. Um, the story of this guitar is that uh, Seymour Duncan uh, was working at the Fender Soundhouse in London at the time. And, you know, very, various famous people used to come and go. Seymour was working there doing guitar repairs, and this was one of the projects that he had on the bencher, an old knackered 1959 Telecaster that was essentially all but ready for the scrap. Um, but, you know, he thought, I'll rescue it, and he put the, uh, you know, the, the, the Gibson accoutrements on. The uh, the pickups came from um, a, a smashed Flying V that belonged to uh, blues guitarist Lonnie Mack, but even they didn't work. They were knackered, so he had to rewind the pickups. Possibly one of the first instances of Seymour Duncan uh, doing a pickup wind, possibly. I don't know. Um Anyway, basically, he put this guitar together, and uh, as I say, he knew Jeff because Jeff was in and out of the uh, Fender Soundhouse at the time, and he was happened to be recording at a nearby studio. So he uh, he took the guitar around to the studio, presented it to Jeff, who was absolutely over the moon with it. Um, here's a picture of Jeff actually playing. I think that might have been one of the pictures that was in the um, the guitarist handbook that uh, made me so so curious about this guitar. Um, yeah, the, this guitar ended up being on one of my favourite uh, Jeff Beck albums, um, Blow by Blow. If you're not familiar with that album, check it out. For me, when I think of, when I picture Jeff Beck, it's this picture that I think of. You know, not the um, you know not the kind of white Stratocaster, the, the signature model that he has these days. For me, this is just the iconic sort of image I have in my mind of Jeff Beck, and it's used. This guitar is used on at least a couple of tracks on Blow by Blow, one of my favourite albums. So hence that's why this one's on the list and there you have it folks those are five more of my bucket list guitars guitars that i would just love to pick up and feel the history and uh just i'm not usually given to such uh kind of things but uh you know kind of feel the vibes off them and um you know just think yeah this is the guitar that was played on this solo or that is the guitar that was played on that riff or something like that it would be such a thrill as ever if you have five more of your favorite uh, guitars that you would love to get your hands on uh, that shaped you as a player that shaped your musical tastes then uh, let me know in the comments section below i'm genuinely interested to know um you know what my audience thinks on such matters um and i love reading the comments so please feel free to to share and that is pretty much it for today folks hope you've enjoyed the video and found it reasonably entertaining and if you have uh, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you haven't already done so and why not give me a like while you're at it don't forget the live stream friday 5 p.m uk time where we talk guitars we drink beer we talk music what's not to like about that it's a fantastic way to kick off the weekend and i'd love to see you there if you can make it but for now i'll bid you all a good day and say thank you so much for watching thank you for your time look after yourselves folks stay well stay safe and above all stay sane bye for now (laughs) 